Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good job. Good job. Must have must have we, we got a funeral director around. around. So <laughs> always, always respond. respond. If anybody if anybody talks talks to you. To <laughs> um, my name is Pat, and, and I want to thank, 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 thank Joe for inviting me to come up. Um, up um, the bar class last night drove over. over uh, uh, so we had it all. What a great, great turnout this place is. It's fantastic to see. Um, um, I'm going to get rolling here, here, but before I do, whenever I give a presentation like this, I always like to let everybody know a couple of things. And the first, and the first thing, thing is, I hope, I hope every one of one you uses today as a starting point. It's great, it's great that, that you came in this morning, morning but if you, but don't, if you do don't do anything with what you learned today after you leave, you're, you're, you're not going to help anyone that you leave behind. behind. So I really, so I really encourage, encourage you, to find a little time in the next month or two to sit down, chat with, chat with Jeff, Jeff, chat with, chat with Joe, Joe, write a few, write a few of these things down. down. And, and, and the reason I encourage you to do that, that face to face is there's, there's not, not a seminar you can come to, there's not, there's not a book you can buy, there's, there's not a web page that you can go look up that takes the place of sitting down with a local person face to face. Asking, asking your questions, your questions and getting answers to them. So I hope so all, all of you um, view it that, that way and kind of make a promise, promise to yourself. yourself. You know what? I'll, I'll get, get this done, done so, so I don't ever have to come, come back to, come back back to, come back to a, a program like this like again. again and and it'll all take care of them. So what I'm going to do as quickly as I can, I'm going to take you through 10 topics that we get, or 10 questions that we get asked all the time at the funeral home. And the first one of those is the word funeral. I'm going to say, say funeral, funeral a, lot a lot today. today. I, want I want you to know, you know what, what I mean, I mean when, when I say that word. word. All, All I mean is a gathering, gathering of people, people after, after someone, someone has passed, passed away. away. Now, that now, might that be might a very, very formal, formal gathering. gathering. It, might it might be an be informal, informal gathering. gathering. You, might you, might you might have it at your church. You might have it in this room right here. You might have it at the funeral home or in your house. And you might not even call it a funeral. You might you call might it a call memorial, memorial service, service or a celebration, celebration of life, life or a tribute. tribute. And, and what I want to encourage everyone that's here this morning is this. No matter what you call it, no matter where you have it, I think it's very important to have some kind of a gathering after people have passed away. Because you've heard it said before, you know, the funeral is about the person that died, but it's for the people that are left behind. Getting that group of people together is a very important thing. Now, you do know folks, and maybe you're one of those folks who says, I don't want a funeral. I'm not going to have a funeral. And I want you to know I agree with you. I don't want a funeral either. All right? I'm in no big hurry for that day to roll around. But it does serve a lot of purposes. And if, even if you don't plan for any kind of a gathering, 
there are still things that need to be done when a person dies. Joe still has questions. You still have to think about things a little bit. So it's a good idea to have these conversations. If you don't have any kind of a funeral, I promise you the people you leave behind are probably going to have one anyway. And that might be the kind of thing I talked about where you get everybody together, or they might have the kind of funeral that goes on for weeks or months at a time. And this has been, there's been no gathering, so someone comes up to you at church on Sunday morning and says, did I hear right? Did, did your brother die recently? And then a different person comes up to you at the grocery store, and someone else comes up to you at the football game on Friday night. Those aren't really appropriate places to have those conversations. So by getting folks together, you help them move forward with what their new reality is going to be. The other thing that happens, and this is kind of sad, but I'm sure you've seen this too, is when there's been no funeral at all, sometimes people will actually avoid people who have suffered a recent loss. And I hear widows and widowers tell me all the time, uh, Pat, the people we used to do things with, they don't call me anymore. I think that's really kind of sad. And now in our defense, we'll say things like, well, I didn't know what to say, or I didn't want to bring it up. And what I want to encourage everyone who's here today to know, it's okay to bring it up. It's okay to ask your friend, how are you doing? Because they want to talk about it. And the other thing I'll share with you is there are no magic words. There's nothing that you can say that'll make it better, but you can be a friend who just listens, and that does help make it better. Now, I know people always come into these types of things with money on their mind. How much does a funeral cost? I'm going to give you some pretty specific answers. What do you mean by a funeral? Because if you see Joe in the grocery store one day, and you walk up, and you're talking, you say, Joe, how much does a funeral cost? That's like asking the Ford dealer, how much is a pickup truck? Right, because you can get a truck for a couple grand, you can get a truck for 20,000, you can get a truck for $80,000. What do you want that truck to look like? Where do you want it to take you? What do you want it to do for you? And funerals are the same way. But with that in mind, if you're gonna take notes today, I'm gonna ask you to write down three numbers. Write down the numbers six, nine, and 15. 6,000, 9,000, $15,000. Those are average cost in this part of the country for how much people spend on a funeral. And I'll get into some details for you here, but here's something to keep in mind. Those are averages. That means you can spend less than average. And I checked with Joe before the program. He said, anybody wanting to spend more than average, that's just fine, all right? So don't feel like you're limited by those numbers up there. We can spend a little more if we want to. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at those numbers. The $15,000 figure would be what we call a traditional casketed burial. A person dies. The funeral home comes and gets the body. They bring them back to their building. They embalm them. They bathe them. They dress them. They put them in whatever casket was picked out. We have a visitation or a wake, a funeral service the next day, and then we drive out to the cemetery and we bury that casket. The figure would be more of what we call a cremation with a memorial service. That's where Joe's doing all of those same things, except he's doing it with an urn instead of with a casket. And then the, the other thing that falls in kind of that $9,000 price range would be something we call a simple burial. And I'll talk about those a little more in a minute, but that's where we take an unembalmed body, place them in a casket, and we bury them pretty quickly after the death has occurred. Probably have a small group of folks out at the cemetery for the burial, and then maybe you have a little larger, more public gathering later on. And then the $6,000 figure would be more of what we call a simple cremation. We're not having a great big group of people together. Things are being kept a little similar. And again, these are just averages. We wanted to give you a very realistic picture of what a funeral costs right now these days. And when we talk about how much does a funeral cost, we need to talk about a group of expenses called cash advance items. What's a cash advance item? These are things that don't come from Joe. Joe doesn't make it any profit on these, but they show up on your funeral bill anyway. These are things like death certificates, clergy honorarium, musicians, renting a building to have the gathering at, um, opening and closing the grave, perhaps a headstone or something of that nature. 
Joe, as a service to your family, will advance the cash to all those different places under your family's direction, and that way they're not running around town writing out checks or trying to, you know, even things up. You got a son says, well, I'll pay for the food, mom, and, and you got a daughter says, well, I'll pay for the flowers, and then they're waiting for the probate to be settled. Joe can just simply advance that cash, put it on the funeral bill, and he does not pad the bill at all. So if your family picks out a lunch that's $812.16, that's what Joe writes on the bill, $812.16. Now I've taken a little time to talk about cash advance items because they can easily be 25 to 33% of your total funeral costs. They can add up pretty quickly. And what do you think has happened, <coughs> excuse me, in the last year to the price of cash advance items? Yeah, they've gone up just like everything else has. And again, these folks don't ask Joe if it's okay to raise their prices. You know, if the cemetery is going to increase their cost, if the florist is going to increase their cost, they just do that. Another thing to talk about is something called a general price list, a general price list or a GPL. What is that? The federal government says every single funeral home in the country has to have a general price list. You can walk in the front door of any funeral home in the country and you can say, I would like a copy of your general price list and by law they must give it to you to keep. You don't have to tell them your name. You don't have to tell them where you live. You don't have to tell them why you want that price list. That's your right as a consumer. But what I would suggest to you, instead of just walking in the door one day, call ahead of time and say, is there someone that can walk me through your price list? because you're never going to need everything that's listed on that price list. There are dozens of different things on there. You can sit down and you can say, hey, here's what I'm thinking about doing, and someone like Jeff can show you, well, here's how much that would cost, and they'll work with you to get an estimate. So the best way to answer that question, how much does a funeral cost? Come on in, sit down with someone from the funeral home, tell them what you'd like to do, and they'll put together an estimate for you. We'll, t we'll spend a little bit of time talking about cremation options. Every single funeral home in Minnesota can provide cremation services to you. It's, there's nothing special about a cremation society. You don't have to sign up ahead of time or anything like that. Your local funeral home can take care of these things for you. Now, if you're someone who's thinking about going the cremation route, the great thing about that option is you have lots of choices, lots of options, and all sorts of different things you can do. But I need is you have lots of options, you have lots of choices, and there's all sorts of different things you can do. 30-some years ago, when I first started helping folks plan funerals, I would really only have to ask them two questions. I would say, well, which casket are we going to use? And ham or turkey? That's all we really had to do. And, and funerals aren't that way anymore, and I think it's good that they're not that way anymore. <laughs> now, when it comes to cremation, it is not a type of funeral. Because I'll hear people say sometimes, well, Pat, I don't have to do any planning because I told my kids I want to be cremated. And I respond to that person respectfully. That's helpful information, but you really haven't told your kids anything. That's like saying I want to be buried. Okay, good to know, but what's going to happen right away? What's going to happen a couple days from now? What's going to happen a week from now? So all cremation is, is just a form of final disposition. Okay, instead of burying a casket, we're cremating the body. Anything Joe can do with a casketed funeral, he can do with a funeral that has an urn and cremation taking place. So one of the first questions Joe might ask you is, when do you want to be cremated? And what are about half of you thinking right now? Never. Yeah, never. <laughs> After I'm dead. Yeah. We know that. So what am, I, what am I asking you here? Do you want to be cremated after the funeral? Do you want to use a rental casket or a cremation casket? Have that visitation and then have the cremation. Do you want to be cremated pretty quickly after the death occurs and then maybe have a gathering with the urn or some pictures or different things like that? One of the nice things about working with Joe is he does offer a third option. And here is some homework for all my cremation consumers in the group this morning. If you're considering cremation, I want you to ask the people who are closest to you, would it be helpful for you to see my body after I die, but before I'm cremated? Okay. Now, you might have four kids, 
Three of them live in the area. They were able to kind of get there and say their goodbyes, but maybe you have a daughter who lives in St. Louis or something. She wasn't able to get home. Well, what Joe can do in those situations is he can bathe the person, he can dress them, he can lay them out nicely, and that immediate family member can come in, spend a few minutes, say their goodbye, and then they can do the cremation afterwards. So just a little homework for you there. A couple other things. You do not have to buy a casket. You do not have to be embalmed in order to be cremated. Now, you might do one or the other or both, depending on the kind of funeral that you planned, but there's no state law there. Likewise, with urns, most people will buy their urn from Joe, but you can also provide your own urn if you want to. I've seen people use cookie jars, tackle boxes, toolboxes. I even heard a story about a, a couple of daughters. They took Dad's bowling ball and cored it out, and then they put his cremains in there, kind of shaved the bottom off so it would sit on the shelf, and then they, they sealed it back up. So Joe will work with you on those things. Now let's say we've got the cremation done. We got them in the cookie jar, wherever we're going to put them. What do you think happens to most cremains at that point in time? Where do they end up? Any thoughts? Any ideas? What could we do with them then? Anybody? A lot of them end up on the shelf. Every soap opera has got somebody on the mantle. <laughs> what else could we do with those cremains? Scatter. We could scatter them on land or water. Yeah. There's all sorts of things we can do because, quite frankly, the government doesn't really care what we do with them after they're cremated. Now, most cremated bodies are buried in a cemetery just like we would with a casket because what happens is you keep mom's urn in the house for a while after she's died, and then eventually you get to thinking, well, what are my kids going to do with this? You know, so again, just because you're being cremated doesn't mean you shouldn't think about what are we going to do with those ashes afterwards. Now, if you want to get creative, you can be made into a diamond ring. You could be part of a coral reef. Uh, you can get shot into space, <clears throat> made into a record of your favorite song. You can have your cremains mixed <clears throat> with some potting soil and plant a rose garden. And there's even a company in Alabama where I live that will load you into 12-gauge shotgun shells and your buddies can all get <laughs> 21 salute. <laughs> so, <clears throat> lots of things we can do. There are movable urns, bird bass, sundials. You can make a little uh, garden in the backyard if you want to. We can't scatter cremains on land or water without the property owner's permission. So, when I die, if I'm cremated, my wife could take me home, spread me on our property. She doesn't have to ask permission, she doesn't have to keep a record of it at all. That's her right, it's our property. Now, if she buries my urn on our property, she has to disclose that when she sells the house. And at that point, she either needs to dig me up and bring me with her and her new husband, or the guy who bought the property might say, well, where is he? He's out by the oak tree, and he's like, fine, leave him there. I don't, I don't care. So um, again, and I'm not against scattering. I just want you all to think it through a little bit. If you scatter the ashes up at the lake place, and then you sell that lake place someday, you can't go back and have a talk with Dad again out in the bench there. You might not always own that family farm. So just think it through and again, have a conversation with Jeff. Talk to Joe. They'll walk through these things for you. Um, simple burials are something we're starting to see more of. Uh, every generation does things a little differently. You know, music, clothing, cars, hairstyle, all those different things. And funerals are kind of the same way. In Minnesota, when somebody dies, we have to do one of four different things within 72 hours. We need to either embalm them, cremate them, bury them, or refrigerate them. So with a simple burial, what we're doing is we're taking an unembalmed body, placing them in the casket, and then we're burying that casket within 72 hours' time. That's a little less expensive than that full traditional funeral, so it's a little more affordable. There are people that don't like the idea of being embalmed or they don't like the idea of being cremated. Well, we don't have to do either one of those things with a simple burial. And for people that are concerned about the environment, is the greenest option because we're not using any embalming fluids, we're not turning on the crematory and burning those fossil fuels. And there are even biodegradable caskets. There are wicker caskets, you can use a pine box, you know, all sorts of different things. So we're a little limited on it by what cemeteries will allow, and I'll touch on that in just a second here. But um, Death away from home, 
not common, but not uncommon. And do you remember that old movie, E.T.? What was E.T. trying to do? He's trying to phone home. That's what you want to do if you're traveling and someone dies away from home. Your very first phone call should be back here and talk to Joe. Let's say I'm in Phoenix with my wife and I die. My wife doesn't know the first thing about the funeral homes in Phoenix. She doesn't know what they charge. She doesn't know if they're reputable. She doesn't know anything about them. She wants to pick up the phone and call our funeral director back home and let he or she contact the funeral home in the area to take care of us. That's going to make sure she's treated properly, and that's also going to save money. Because if she picks up the phone and calls a funeral home in Phoenix, they're going to charge her their regular retail rates. But in your case, if Joe calls that funeral home, funeral homes have what they call courtesy rates among themselves, and that will help keep your cost down a little bit. Now, if you're someone like me who travels a lot, um, they do have a nice travel protection plan that's available at the funeral home, and I know exactly how this works because I bought this same exact thing through the funeral home where I live. I gave them a check for $525. I never have to give them another penny. And I am now covered for the rest of my life anywhere in the world if I die more than 75 miles from my front door, which I am right now. And the reason I got this was not so much for the monetary benefits, which are, are really good, but for my wife's convenience. Because if I go back to my hotel room tonight and I don't wake up tomorrow and I don't have the travel plan, my wife's going to be on the phone for the next 18 hours. And people are going to be peppering her with all sorts of questions that she's probably in no frame of mind to be answering. So with the travel plan, it's one phone call. Funeral home comes, and any local funeral home comes and gets my body. They take me back. It pays for the cremation or the embalming, either one. It pays for them to get the paperwork together. In my case, they'll be shipping my body back home, so it pays for the air tray, pays for the funeral home to take me to the airport, pays for the flight back down south, and then it pays for my local funeral director to come and get my body. So again, ask Jeff about this if it's something that you might be interested in looking at. And the other thing about this travel plan, I was writing that check out and I thought, I can't even fly sitting up for $525 anymore. So I would finally get some good leg room uh, on that flight if I need it. Real quickly, vaults, headstones, <coughs> excuse me, and obituaries. There is no state law that says you need to buy any of those three things. If you do not want to run an obituary in the paper, you do not have to. If you want, Joe will put that obituary on his web page for you. That way, if you have an aunt living in Arizona or something, she could go and print that off or whatever. When it comes to headstones and vaults, now there's no state law, but every cemetery gets to make their own rules. So what one cemetery may let you do, another cemetery may say, no, you can't do that here. So they've got a reference at the funeral home of all the different local cemeteries that are around, and you can ask them about which one, and they can let you know what they will allow, what they won't allow. Some of them won't allow upright. Some will allow you to bury one casket and one urn in one spot. It's different for all of them. So something you want to research ahead of time. Um, let's talk about funeral trusts a little bit. And before I get into this topic, Joe wants me to stress to everyone who's here today, and I want you to share this with other people in the community. You absolutely do not have to prepay to pre-plan. Okay, so don't let the money part stop you from sitting down, talking to the funeral home. Now, I'm a very analytical person. I, I can't even decide where to go to lunch without looking at a spreadsheet. You know, I, and I've looked at these funeral trusts inside out, upside down. I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't have one. They're just a great idea, but it is not a requirement to do it. So don't let the money part stop you. Now, I, you also heard me say prepaying a funeral. And in Minnesota, that's actually a misnomer. When you set up and fund a funeral trust, you are not giving your money to the funeral home. It always remains your money. Now, here's a bit of a nuance, and I want to do a good job explaining this. In Minnesota, there's no such thing as a do-it-yourself funeral trust. You have to work with a funeral home to set one up properly, but it does not become the funeral home's money, 
and you have the right to use any funeral home you want to when you die. So you have to work with the funeral home to set one up. But it, again, lots of consumer protections in there. So how does it work in Minnesota? There are six or seven different insurance companies that operate in Minnesota. The only thing that they do is hold funeral dollars. They don't do car insurance, they don't do house insurance or anything like that. Then there is a Minnesota state specific language irrevocable trust assignment document that is laid on top of that policy outlining all of the different consumer protections that I'm going to take you through here in a minute that turns it into a funeral trust. So it is not just a bank account. It is not just an insurance policy. It's a specifically defined entity under Minnesota state law. But what I want you to remember is the money belongs to you. It does not belong to the funeral home. The funeral home could go out of business. The funeral home could burn to the ground. It would have no impact on your funeral trust because it is not under their control. So how do these things work? First of all, they do grow income tax free. So you will not get a 1099 each year. You don't have to report that on your income taxes and pay tax on that. The money does not have to pass through probate. Typically at the time of death, these funds are released within 48 to 72 hours time, which is nice for you because then your kids aren't coming back to town, putting the funeral on their credit card, and then waiting for the estate to get settled in order to get reimbursed for that type of thing. If there's extra money, Above and beyond what you need, it must be returned to your family. The funeral home can't keep that extra money. Um, a couple other things. I already mentioned this. You can't be locked into a funeral home. So you have to work with one to set one up, but you can use these monies at any funeral home you want to, any, any funeral home in the world. So if you move, your funeral dollars follow you. It's also reinsured by the state of Minnesota. Your file is your property. I'm going to talk to you in a minute about a really nice planning tool that Joe and Jeff uh, will give you. All you have to do is ask for one. But let's say you fill this out, you get some plans on paper, it's on file at the funeral home, and you decide that you want to use a different funeral home. That is your right as a consumer. You can take that file to any funeral home you want to. And I saved what I think is the best part of these funeral trusts for last. And that is nothing you write down is set in stone you have the right to change your funeral plans at any time. Can anyone tell me what that's a picture of on the bottom of the screen up there? Have you ever seen one of those before? What is that? It's a round to it. Or as they say where I live in Alabama, I want to help all y'all get around to it. Okay. I meet someone new and they find out what I do for a living and they say the same two things every time. The first thing they say is, wow, that's a really good idea. I'm going to do that. The second thing they say is, but those are some big decisions. I need to think about this a little before I write anything down. Coming from Minnesota, folks, what typically happens when we think about things for a little bit? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. Jeff has a really nice 14-page funeral and cremation planning guide that takes you through this process in kind of a fill-in-the-blank question and answer. It gets a little harder as it goes on. The first ones are really easy. All you have to do is ask them to get one for you. The funeral home will order them. They will pay for them, and they'll give them to you for free. We just don't want to order any more than we have to. We're going to do this same program tonight in Wadena, and so we'll figure out how many books we need up there, how many books we need down here. We'll order them, and when they come in, Jeff will give you a call, and he'll get them in your hands. But what I encourage you to do is just get one of those books. Take it home. Spend 10 minutes on it. Fill out the easy stuff. And then keep working with the funeral home and get some of these plans done, because if, even if that's the only thing you ever do is spend 10 minutes on it, someone's going to be grateful for having that little bit of information on the day you pass away. It's going to guide them, point them in the right spot. Now, I want to take a little side trip as I start to wrap things up this morning. I've got about 10 minutes left with you here. And you might be wondering, why is Pat talking about this? And what does it have to do with funerals? And if you just kind of come with me, I promise you, I'll bring it back around to funerals and you see why I felt it was important to talk about this. But as we get older, What's typically the biggest financial threat that we worry about? What's going to happen and where are we going to lose all our money? 
yeah, I'm going to get sick, I'm going to go in the nursing home, and shh, it's all going to be gone. We all worry about the cost of long-term care. I looked up the American Council on Aging this weekend. Uh, the average cost of a nursing home in this area of the state is $11,600 a month. I don't know what that would do to your pocketbook, but it would start to blow ours up pretty quickly. Most of us can't afford to pay that for very long. And what happens is Medicare pays next to nothing. Our normal health insurance pays next to nothing for long-term care stays. And we might have to look at the county for help in paying our bills. Now, before I go any further, I got a quick two-question pop quiz for everyone who's here today. Okay, so here's question number one before I go on. Please raise your hand if you plan on living in the nursing home someday. <laughs> Nobody, all right? Question number two is easier. This time. Raise your hand if you think there's a chance the guy sitting next to you might go to the nursing home someday. <laughs> it's kind of what we think, isn't it? You know, never going to happen to me. I don't know about the other guy. Well, sometimes bad stuff happens to good people. And once we start to run out of money and we have to apply to the county for Medicaid or medical assistance in order to help paying these bills. And I'm not going to go too deep into the woods with this. But what I would need to do is if I ended up in the nursing home, they're going to take a look at all of the assets that my wife and I own. And my wife gets to keep our house. My wife gets to keep one car. She gets to keep about $150,000 in assets. She gets to keep her, pre, uh, her funeral trust. And she gets to keep a certain amount of income every month. Everything else that we own above and beyond that cabins, hunting land, uh, RVs, um, life insurance cash values, IRAs, 401ks. That all has to come over to my side of the ledger, and I have to do what the government calls is a spend down. I have to spend down all those assets until all I have left is $3,000. And you noticed I called it a spend down? I can't do a give it away down. Because the government says, when I go to apply for Medicaid, I can't have given away anything to anyone in any amount for any reason in the five years before I need Medicaid. And that's impossible to figure that out and do that math. Because I feel pretty good right now. But my five-year look-back period could start tomorrow, for all I know. And then if we can't get the money back, the government can go after the people we gave the money to to get it back. So the reason I spent some time talking about this topic, 40% of funeral trusts are never set up until after someone goes in the nursing home. It's one of those things we were going to think about or maybe get around to someday and then we never did. So I encourage you folks, it's a lot easier to do this kind of planning now than when you've just had to go through the ordeal of putting someone you love and care about in a nursing home. It makes things a lot tougher. So I'm going to skip this one, and I'm going to start wrapping things up here. I want to hit on emotions just a little bit as I finalize things here, but would you believe me if I told you sometimes families get into arguments at the funeral home? <laughs> Not a surprise, I know. Now, I tell you what, most families don't. Most families get along pretty well, but every once in a while, the gloves kind of come off, and, and what I've discovered is they're not arguing about what three songs to play at mom's funeral. They're arguing about stuff that happened 30 years ago. Still hasn't been resolved, and now you're kind of the Supreme Court family, you're gone, and boy, here we go. Well, if you've got that funeral trust done, at least we're not arguing about what we're gonna be doing for the funeral, because we've got it planned out. Maybe, you know, we can buy a little time before the ugly comes out. The other thing that can happen is when there's been no planning ahead of time is your kids could have very different financial circumstances. They probably do. Now, I have one brother and I have one sister, and I'm very fortunate. My mother's still alive. But let's say my mom dies next month and her funeral bill comes to $12,000. Well, that's easy math. Each of the three kids, we write out a check for $4,000. But what happens if my sister's sitting there and she doesn't have $4,000? How's she going to feel in that moment? And maybe she feels like she doesn't have a right to say anything because she's not paying for her fair share. 
That's just one of the reasons we got a funeral trust for my mother. And I do have to let everybody know, though, my sister caught wind that I told that at seminars. She wants you all to know she does have $4,000, okay? So just, just so you know. Um, and here's your last bit of homework. I want each of you to go home this afternoon, call up your kids, and tell them you need 10000 bucks in 72 hours. I don't know. Again, maybe you got a kid that says, is that all you need, Mom? Because I'll give you some more if you need it. But that's kind of what happens when someone dies. And I want to stress to you, Joe is not going to turn his back on your family if they don't have $10,000 in 72 hours. He's going to work with you. But again, that funeral trust is just the answer to that problem. And one of the things I neglected to mention about the funeral trust is it's a protected asset if you ever go into the nursing home. They can't go after that money for your health care costs. Your creditors, if you die owing someone money, they can't go after your funeral trust either. So it is treated very nicely by the state of Minnesota. So what are the four things you have to do to set up a funeral trust? Have to have a written contract with a funeral home, something in writing. There's no limit on how much you want to put in, but we have to allocate every dollar in there. So this much for the flowers, this much for the minister, this much for the urn, that kind of thing. Must be irrevocable in nature, and that's what gives it the protection. Nobody can make you take this money out and spend it for anything else. And then the beneficiary has to be those exact words you see up there in the, on the final paragraph, any funeral home as their interest may appear. And the contingent beneficiary must be your estate. Because if there's extra money, who gets to have the money? The funeral home or your family? goes back to your family. And we use any funeral home because remember you can change funeral homes if you want to. And then here on number two as well, if you plan your funeral one way today and you get the money set aside in there to pay for it and then you want to change your mind, you can do that. Now you can't take the extra out until after you die, but whatever money isn't spent again goes back to your family so you don't have to worry about those concerns. And there might be someone sitting here today who says, well how how can I fund these funeral trusts? Well, a lot of folks, they've kind of got some money parked somewhere. They're just in case money, and they decide, you know what? I'm just going to write a check out for the whole thing and fund it that way. Other folks are like, well, you know, I'll put $1,000 in there today, and I'll add some more down the road if I want to. And still other people say, you know what? I would like to do something every month for three years or, or whatever. You tell Jeff how you want to fund it. He'll work with you to find a way that works for you. So there's a funeral plan for anybody out there, any budget, anything you want to do. And then the last thing I want to touch on here, sometimes I give this whole presentation and some guy, because it's usually a guy because we're so smart, comes up to me afterwards and says, I don't need one of them funeral trusts because here's what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to put my money in a pay on death account and I'm going to tell my daughter, you use that money to pay for my funeral. And then when I die, it doesn't have to go through probate, and my daughter will pay for my funeral that way. That can work, but sometimes it doesn't work. If you go into the nursing home, a pay-on-death account is not a protected asset. Your daughter might be the beneficiary, but that money isn't going to be there to use for your funeral because you're going to have to use it to spend for your health care costs. Or maybe your daughter doesn't even show up at the funeral home with the money. No, I'm not saying she would do that, but it asked me in 40 years if I've seen it happen. You're darn right I've seen it happen because there's no obligation. Or my daughter would probably show up and sit down with her three brothers and say, well, that piker dad only put five grand in there, <laughs> and I had put ten in, and she put five in her pocket. I, you know, so these things, all of these things can cause a problem. Just putting someone's name on a bank account with you does not protect it from the nursing home. It doesn't guarantee that the money's going to be there. And life insurance policies are the same thing. Most of them have a cash value. And that cash value counts as an asset if we enter a nursing home. So we may have to cash that policy and use it to pay for our health care costs, and then it's not going to be there any longer. So if you have a small life insurance, tell Jeff about it. He can take a look at it. Sometimes people will roll that money right into a funeral trust. Uh, there's lots of different things you can do, but Jeff needs to look up the hood and look at them. So as we wrap things up today, I've dumped a lot on you. What we're going to do in a minute is we're going to have Joe and Jeff come up and you can ask questions of them, local knowledge that I don't have. But what do you do with everything I just told you about today? 
And it's really pretty simple. You should have a piece of paper in front of you. It's kind of a peach colored piece of paper. It should say program evaluation or something of that nature. It wasn't in your folder. It was set out on the table. Yes. Would you mind holding that up so people can kind of see that right there? What I would appreciate everyone doing with that form is two things. First of all, tell us what you liked about the program today. Tell us what you think could make a better program. Joe would like to do something again in town like this next year. If you have ideas for a, 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 maybe a different guest speaker, um, prime rib instead of cookies, you know, anything at all, let us know on that form. And then the second thing I want you to do with that form is down at the bottom, fill in your name, fill in your phone number, and tell them how many of those books to order for you. If you're a married couple, you'll need two, one for each of you. If you have a brother or sister or a good friend in town that you think would appreciate it, we don't mind getting these in folks' hands. We just want them to know that they're going to do something with it. So what will happen is we'll order them. They'll come in. Jeff will give you a call. He wants to sit down with you for a short meeting to get you started. And every once in a while someone says, well, Pat, how long is a short meeting? That's up to you. We have some people that five minutes and we're done. And we have other people an hour and five minutes because they've been thinking about this and they just kind of want to get the ball rolling. So that's up to you. But we want to deliver it in person. We want to give it to you and answer some questions and get you started. So I'm going to have, and then when you're done with that form, just give it to Jeff or Joe or just turn it over and leave it on your table and they'll pick them up when we're all done. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Joe and Jeff now. I want those two to come on up. Let's do some questions and answers. And then I heard there's a rumor of lunch afterwards. Is that right, Joe? All right. So thank you. Oh, I'll take all the applause y'all want to give that. That's fine. You're going to need the mic, aren't you? Okay. <laughs> so as Pat said, we, we're going to take a little of some questions. Do you have anything you want to say before we do that? No, I'm just waiting for the door prize. Yeah, like to yeah, that's, there's like that to too. Make people happy. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so, are there any questions? Um, again, for Pat too, but uh, any questions for uh, about our local area here? That of course uh, he's not 100% on, but I got to tell you, everything he told you is right on the mark, right on the mark. Especially when he's talking about the rules in the state of Minnesota and stuff. Uh, he really nailed it. But yes. Put money in. So, set a, a limit on helping anyway. Right. So when you um, when you set money aside, mm -hmm. is it gaining any interest? Is it growing over time? And state of Minnesota requires that the accounts do go into an interest-bearing account. Uh, so that is something, especially when you're doing paid in full accounts as opposed to payment plans. When you do paid in full accounts, uh, it. It does. It starts at that point and it compoundedly, if that's even a word, it gains interest at a compound interest rate. Any yep. idea what that has been in, in of course, interest rates are going to change. Pat, it, it does change. Right now it's 2.38%. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the biggest thing with that is all the interest you get on that is tax free. So you don't ever have to worry about claiming it on your taxes or paying tax on that. So it's equivalent to about 4% of something that's taxable. Yeah, taxable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. What about a policy, or rather policy, uh, you know, if it's an insurance policy, they call it a funeral policy, but I guess because it's a life insurance policy. It is life insurance based, yes. Well, there are ways of adapting existing policies. Uh, there's also the option of you can move money from one place to another. So if you're working with a company that is not adaptable and you really want it secured and protected, we would want to transfer it into an account that is protected. So there are a couple of ways of, of working with existing funds that are already set aside. 
So usually with the cash value of those accounts, not necessarily the death benefit. I would have to look at it because the, some companies will assign the policy. If you can assign it, that's immediate and it's good to go. If you have to change the ownership to one of the kids, there's a fi that five-year look-back period. So then you'd want to change it. But I would have to look at it to be able to advise you properly. Yeah, as, as Pat kind of indicated, there are some companies that do this. That's what they do. They don't, they don't mess around with property and casualty and all these uh, car insurance and things like that. They're focused on setting up funeral accounts. And in doing that, they also focus on the state that you live in. Okay, so the rules in Minnesota are different than Wisconsin and Iowa and, and so on and so forth. And so it's best to deal with a company that is, ba not based, but that is doing business in Minnesota and following the guidelines that the state of Minnesota is using. Because there are federal rules, but there's also state individual rules too. And there's actually county rules. Yep, there you go. Especially when we're dealing with medical assistance, yeah. it's it's a county it's a county by county uh, scenario there. So, anything else? Do you know how uh, that person is talking about dying in Arizona or whatever they want to be buried here? Mm -hmm. Is there specific requirements as far as being embalmed and that type of thing? Yes. Yep. In order to cross state lines and embalming is required. So um, even if a death occurs, in, and this is again if we're doing traditional funerals, as Pat said, you are not required to be embalmed or buy a casket if a cremation, a simple cremation is your choice. Um, when those occurrences happen, we usually deal with a local funeral home that us will assist us become basically an agent or an extension of us. Uh, and they will provide the necessary requirements, whether it's an embalming, whether it's the cremation or whatever. But yes, to cross state lines, you do need to be either embalmed or have the cremation take place locally. Okay. I could. We're really eager to do door prizes. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to do our, our door prizes, our more local things. I want to thank those who are... Uh, have joined us both on Facebook at the Schuler Family Funeral Homes Facebook page and Schuler Family Funeral Homes YouTube page. Uh, know that you can go back uh, to this and re-watch it if there's something. See, I didn't, I, I just don't know what a round two it is. <laughs> you can go back and rewind it, listen to it again and say, hey, I still don't know what it is. But uh, so feel free to do that. Every, everyone has that possibility either on our page on YouTube or on Facebook, okay? So thanks for joining us online. We're gonna cut you off now and we're gonna take care of our local people, so.